Good morning everybody and a big warm welcome to our online gathering for Parkhead and the Charter. And this morning a really special welcome to a new arrival in our congregation, baby Zuri Olive Ajoa Freeman, who was born on Monday the 28th of June, weighing in at seven pounds three. So a massive congratulations to Shona and Will and the rest of the Freeman family. And we really look forward to meeting your wee girl very soon. Well, I hope that we're all having a good summer and feeling relaxed and managing to get some rest. The last 18 months, of course, has been very difficult for us all. And we remind ourselves as well that we have a God who encourages us to rest. So I hope you all get a chance to do that at some point over the summer. And there are just now signs of hope as the government continues to relax some of the COVID restrictions that we've been in. And of course, as a church, we are longing for things to change quickly but we're sensing that need still just to be patient for a wee bit longer. We'll of course keep you up to date with any of the changes that are going to take place regarding any of our meetings and we'll do that via email or WhatsApp. So please, please get in touch with us and tell us if you're not getting any of our communications or if you're not part of either of these groups and we'll make sure we get you added. We'll just a short, short section from the Bible to focus us in on God this morning as we worship together. Psalm 116. It says, return to rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. And we begin with that in mind today, no matter how we're feeling just now, to choose in our praise and our worship time to remember God's goodness to us and to return to peace, return to rest. So let's do that this morning as we worship him together. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. 
Just, um, I've just come into the woods for a walk and <laughs> I'm just using it as an opportunity to pray and a few steps inside of the woods and I spotted a deer just up the hill from me and instead of running away as it normally does the deer looked at me and then started slowly wandering down the hill towards me. It paused a few times en route to eat, eat some leaves and it crossed right in front of me. So close that I was not even wanting to pull my camera out of my pocket in case I scared it. And it looked at me, it saw me, didn't seem bothered and carried on walking across the path and off into the woods in the opposite direction. And even as I started to walk, it, <laughs> it didn't get frightened and it just wandered off quite happy. And it just it took my breath away. And it reminded me just how amazing creation is. And it also reminded me that the way that God made us and made the animals was for us to exist together. Not to be hunting each other or scaring each other, but to exist together, enjoying the earth together, the plants and the water and the forests. And it's a really nice reminder of that just as I entered these woods here for a walk. And so I wanted just as a little message for the children this morning, I wanted to remind you that you're here on earth to, to share it. Not just sharing with animals and wildlife, but also other humans. And it's important for us to take care of it and to respect those other humans not to try and scare them, to try and exist with them. To always have a smile ready and a kind word. Even if at times those other humans might be our annoying little brother or sister or our mums or our dads that we don't want to listen to. I just want to remind you this morning that actually we were all created to get on with each other. Humans and animals too. Ephesians chapter 2 and reading from verse 11. One in Christ. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. 
For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So we've got two sections to look at in the book of Ephesians today. But this first part that's just been read out, it's perhaps quite hard for us to get our heads around here in Parkhead in Glasgow in the year 2021. It talks about division between groups of people who perhaps we don't hear about as often in today's context in our city, Jews and Gentiles. So I know a lot of you will probably know exactly what these two terms mean, but for the rest of us, perhaps it's worth doing a wee bit of a recap just now. Well, the Jews mentioned here, they were the historic people of God, descended from the Israelite people in the Old Testament, whom God had chosen to be his people, that he would reveal himself to, that he'd show himself to, and through whom he would show himself to the rest of the world. Therefore, they had all the history of God, they had the background, they had God's word, the Torah, as well as all the customs and the culture that had been built up and then passed down from one generation to the next. Then there were the Gentiles, and they were basically anyone who wasn't Jewish. And therefore, they were people who had little knowledge of that Jewish culture, and people who would have often felt like outsiders from all of that. But of course, because Jesus came and ministered to both Jews and Gentiles, and then encouraged his disciples to do the same, it meant that the early days of the church, this new community of faith, were characterised by people from both a Jewish background accepting Jesus as Lord, but also people of a Gentile background also accepting Jesus as Lord. And actually the likelihood would have been that most of the church that Paul was writing to in Ephesus would probably have been from a Gentile or non-Jewish background. And actually what we see reading through other parts of the New Testament is that this mix of Jews and Gentiles in the same church sometimes caused a few problems. There were sometimes clashes of custom and culture between these two groups that sometimes made it quite hard for the new church community, even though both these groups were now in relationship with Jesus Christ. And so there was sometimes division between these two groups. And this is what Paul is seeking to address in this part of his letter. But just in case we think this was a problem only for back then when there was the whole Jew and Gentile thing, I'd like to try and bring this text into our situation here in Parkhead in Glasgow and have a brief think at one of the ways we still see division a bit like this in the Church of Jesus Christ to this day. We're going to hear a little bit from Adele just now on this. So Adele, thank you so much for being willing to share some of your experiences. So looking back into my childhood, growing up in the East End of Glasgow, not only in the community that I lived in, but also the home I was brought up in, I was affected by bigotry and sectarianism. My family were divided. My mother and father would argue and my mother would would bless the Pope and my father would F the Pope if you would excuse that expression. And I remember I used to be so confused by this. 
and it was all done in the name of religion. I was also affected in the community as a result of this. My brother went to a football match one Saturday and on the way back home he was seriously assaulted because the people who assaulted him did not like the football team that my brother supported and my brother's arm was broken and he was quite seriously hurt and again I remember thinking this is not right, this is awful and all in the name of religion and so I grew up affected by this and didn't understand that until I became a Christian and learned the word of God that this is nothing to do with religion and certainly not the religion that we Christians celebrate and embrace that God is the God of all that labelling people for any reason is not of God. Thinking one group of people is superior to another or simply hurting each other because we have different opinions or different beliefs is really the opposite of who our God is. And so that, that brought me great peace. It brought me great relief when I began to discover this. And it, when you get peace, then you are able to live at peace. And that was a beautiful gift I got because God enabled me to live at peace with everybody. It didn't matter who or what they believed because they are all children of God if they, if they choose to be. And so this was a great revelation to me and, and brought great healing to the, the wounds, to the trauma, to the pain that I suffered in my childhood as a result of sectarianism and bigotry. And so I'm so thankful that I was able to break that off my family and teach them that it doesn't matter what people label themselves, we are to love them, we are to, we have to, for God asks us to accept them and see that they are children of God also. And so I'm so thankful for the knowledge I have in God's word that broke all that off my life. Thank you. Well, Adele, thank you so much for sharing that. It's been so helpful for us this morning and giving us a wee glimpse of just one of the ways that we might still see that kind of division that we talk, talk about between Jew and Gentile in our city and in our community today. Well, just in wrapping up from this section, I don't want to say too much, but very simply, what this passage serves to do is remind us that because of the cross, the greatest leveller of all, we are one. There are to be no divisions in Jesus Christ. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 that we read from, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people, when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. And later on in this section, he goes on to say that no one should therefore consider themselves to be in any way a foreigner or a stranger from each other, or somehow part of the wrong group, but instead everyone should consider themselves to be fellow citizens together, members of God's household. And so essentially with all this, what's happening here is Paul is using a lot more words to describe something that he says again and again in his letters, and often much more briefly than this. Words that will be familiar to a lot of us. He says this, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
This famous statement from Paul summarises all that he says in this section, but not only that, it takes it even further. It widens that range of social divisions out to include other things, not just Jew and Gentiles. It says there are to be no social divisions at all if you follow Jesus Christ. And so it wouldn't be taking it too far for us to be able to put other things into that list, things that we see in our world today. We could say equally today that this means there is to be no black or white, that there is to be no rich or poor, there is to be no married or single, there is to be no young or old, because all are one in Christ Jesus. Well, I wonder if there are any groups of people that you struggle with. I wonder even if there are people in our church family, or people from the wider community of faith, People who have come to know and accept Jesus, perhaps just like you, but maybe from a very different background. And perhaps you really struggle with that. Maybe you almost feel like Paul says here, that there is a dividing wall between you and them. Well, of course, as always, I'm preaching this to myself and I'm assessing my own heart in all of this. And so what I want to simply do is encourage us to take time today, or even this week, to sit with God and ask him to examine us and let him reveal to us so gently as he always does if there are any people or any groups that we are somehow divided from or people or groups that we struggle to make welcome so that again he can remind us that all the dividing lines have been broken down and that we are fellow citizens, that we are members of the same household all in and because of our Lord Jesus Christ.
believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. So we're now on to the second section of what we're covering today. And here, Paul is continuing on this theme of talking about those who were non-Jewish or the Gentile people in the church. And they would have been a big part of the church in Ephesus, as I mentioned earlier on. And there's just one particular verse from this final section that I'd like to focus in on. And it's in verse 2 of chapter 3, where Paul says this. He says, God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. And actually, in his ministry, this is what Paul was known for. It says in Romans chapter 15 that he knew he was to be a minister of Christ, particularly to the Gentile people. And so we see it in all that he did, particularly in the book of Acts, when he forged into new areas and he took this new gospel message to people who weren't necessarily part of the historic people of God. It doesn't mean that he never spoke to anyone else or that he only concerned himself with people who were Gentile, but instead that these were the people, these Gentile people were the folks that he felt particularly equipped to reach out to. And in some ways it's funny because Paul wasn't a Gentile himself, he was actually a Jew in fact, he was one of the strictest types of Jew, a Pharisee. But nonetheless, God still led him to minister to the Gentiles. And sometimes that's the way that God works today and how he leads people in ministry. I'd like to illuminate this a little bit by letting you hear a little bit of testimony from Wes White. He's someone who's a good friend of the church. He's spoken for us before. And in many ways, he has had an experience a bit like the Apostle Paul. So let's listen in and hear about his ministry and one of the ways that God has particularly led him. Hello, my name is Wesley White. I know many of you there at Parkhead and Naz quite well, and it's just a joy to come and share with you a brief uh, word, a testimony of what we're up to. Uh, I've been in Glasgow with my wife Cindy now for 20 years. In July of this year, we celebrated 20 years here. Uh, we came here with our five children, and some of them are here, and some of them are elsewhere in the world. 
Our, my time here has been always a split between half-time teaching in theological institutions and the other half in hands-on practical ministry, church planting, most recently with what has developed into what we call the Upper Room Church, which is all uh, refugees, asylum seekers coming from countries in the Mideast, primarily from Iran, a few from Iraq, and uh, some Afghans and Kurdish peoples that spread a variety of four countries. Commonly to them all, though, is the language of Farsi, which is what we do translate everything from English into Farsi. As you're thinking about this passage in Ephesians where Paul is giving such a particular attention to the Gentiles, reminds me of how I got into this. Uh, I really believe in a theology of place, that where God puts you. And so when I was teaching at ICC, uh, International Christian College, I just felt strongly I, I ought to be involved in ministry around there, not just here in the West End. And that led to joining, uh, seeking out what was happening and found out about St. Rolex Church and ministry to refugee people. And out of that, uh, myself and a few others began a football time that also included afterwards food, and Bible study, uh, and it was connecting with Iranians, Afghans, uh, Kurdish people, and all again Farsi speaking. How did I know that this was something God was leading me into? Well, I would say I really felt strong about having received such grace in my own life. I wanted to be able to extend that grace to others. And this was an opportunity to do that. Coupled with, I have to say, just pure obedience to the biblical call to give concentrated focus to the marginalized people whose voices are unheard, which I think asylum seekers and refugees surely represent. Just purely, this is what the scriptures call us to. I want to obey that. I had always been uh, so impacted by the life and testimony of an early missionary named Jim Elliott. Some of you will have heard of him, but he made a statement in one of his journals that stuck with me still to this day uh, speaks to me. He said kind of graphically, what most Christians need is not a call from God, but a kick in the rear. And I really agreed with that. Just read what the scriptures say and obey it. And the call to give attention to those whose voices are so often squelched. So now that has developed not just out of pure obedience or the idea of grace given to me that I can extend that grace to others, but a really deep love for these people, uh, refugees and asylum seekers here in Glasgow that are coming to our doors, but also uh, around the world. Um, around the world, they focus on those who are have left homelands and are in such uh, places where they're um, really in need of support and love and such an opportunity to share with them grace as I've been given grace. So that's a bit of what I'm about and what we do. Thanks so much. Have a great uh, rest of your worship time. Well, a really big thank you to Waze for taking the time to record that and for really helping us to understand a little bit of how that part of the Bible might look today. Well, it doesn't always work that we have a very specific calling, maybe like Wes or the Apostle Paul, but it may be that God has particularly equipped us or shaped us so that we are able to reach certain people. I'd like to ask us this. Who has God given you a special responsibility to extend grace to? Who is he asking you to reach? Who is he putting in front of you? Maybe it's a long-term thing or maybe it's just for a season. A few examples, well maybe you're a, a young mum and God is leading you to reach out to other young mums, to support them and love them and to point them to Jesus ultimately. 
Or maybe you're a boss and you've got a team around about you who are looking to you for leadership and for your example, and you've got a desire to connect them to Jesus. Or maybe you're in recovery and you've got valuable experience and wisdom to share with others who are perhaps still trapped in addiction. Well, whatever it is, I want to encourage you to recognise it and to ask God that he would use you in this to extend his grace and to build his kingdom here on earth. Let's pray and ask God that he would help us to do that even just now. Lord, we praise you for the grace that you extend to all. And Lord, we thank you that you use us to cooperate with all the amazing things that you do in this earth, the ways that you build your kingdom. Lord, would you show us today if there are people or if there are groups or situations that you are especially leading us to minister in. Lord, so that we might recognise it and follow you more into all the amazing plans and purposes that you have for us. And all the amazing ways, Lord, that you would use us. So God bless us in this, we pray.
Well, just in closing, I wanted to say again a big thank you to both Adele and also to Wes for recording those videos. It really helps sometimes to have modern day examples of some of these parts of scripture. So thank you so much to both Adele and Wes. Also, we just want to keep on saying thank you to our tech team uh, for making this kind of thing online church possible and the work that they put into this every single week. Every time I speak to them, I get reminded of just how much work this is for them. And we're so thankful and so grateful for all that they do. And I want to as well just thank you and encourage you to keep on tuning in to our online church services. We know that there is signs of hope and signs of reopening. But for the meantime, just to keep on encouraging one another to not give up the habit of meeting together, but to keep worshipping together and keep joining in fellowship in these Sunday mornings that we have. Well, let's just take a moment to thank God for these things and to pray for everything that we do this week. God, we thank you for the testimonies that we've heard this morning and Lord, for the ways that it helps us to understand your word better and to think about how it might look in today's world. Lord, we thank you also for the great work that the tech team do week by week. Lord, would you bless them for all the, the work and all the time, the effort that they put in each week. And Lord, we just pray for ourselves this week. Lord, even though we may be weary, even though we may be struggling, Lord, would you continue to help us, continue to walk with us, remind us, Lord, to not give up the habit of meeting together, but to continue to gather with our brothers and sisters in Christ for worship and for fellowship. So God, would you bless us just now, we pray. Amen.